Good. Shall I start? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Is the mic good? All right. Good evening, everyone. And uh, it, it's great to see such a crowd coming. And I'm really honored to be invited by uh, my dear friend, uh, Sergio, to talk about um, a topic that is very dear to my heart. And uh, I hope this evening will be very good for you to have some good takeaways to implement at your organization wherever you work because I think um, that is the current way of how you actually have to deliver software and, and uh, to be able to produce the best uh, product. Uh, my name is Flavio Monigatti. Uh, I work for Credit Suisse uh, Singapore. I'm in Singapore since about one and a half years, a bit more than one and a half years. Before that, I worked in London and before that in Zurich and uh, also with, with uh, Credit Suisse um, in IT, obviously. And uh, before that, uh, um, I did a postdoctoral research studies in uh, bioinformatics and uh, biology. So if anything is wrong from a technical perspective, Please keep in mind, I'm a bio biologist by training. <laughs> Good. Um, so, ah. so from an agenda, I would like to uh, first uh, talk about a bit uh, of inspirational material that uh, I would like you to, to read. If you haven't uh, read it yet, it, it's really important material and I think you will get a lot of out of it if you if you go through it. Um, the second point is I'm gonna talk about interview questions and I'm gonna tell you the the reason very soon why I'm, I'm talking about that. It's all good? And um, uh, then I'm gonna talk about cars, birds, and st statistics and switches, and uh, you might find now that this has not much to do with uh, lean development or continuous delivery, but hopefully you will realize then that it has everything to do with it, and it's a great <laughs> analogy that uh, will help you understand the concepts, hopefully better. And last but not least, then I'm going to talk about continuous delivery and the experiences that I have made uh, in my past uh, companies and uh, work experience and what it means to me. And at the end of the uh, of this session, then we can go back to the interview answers and uh, hopefully get something out of it. And then last but not least, if you have any questions, let's go through, through those. If you have any questions during uh, the talk, interrupt me and uh, if I can answer that, I will answer that. If not, uh, hopefully we will pause until the end and then by the time we have forgotten about it and then I don't have to answer that. <coughs> so, does it work? Yes. Very good. So the first uh, uh, books, and there are many books on this topic, but I think this is really uh, one of the, the, the most inspirational books about the topic is Lean Enterprise uh, by Chess Humble, John Molesky, and, and Barry O'Reilly. Um, it really gives a very, very good uh, introduction into the topics and, and uh, explains how big enterprises, can, uh, by applying lean methodologies, can actually deliver high-quality products in time and at the same time are able to innovate. Um, uh, very recent, yes. Very recent. I don't know how old it is, but it is relatively recent, yes. Um, and it has a lot of anecdotes, and, and I'm going to talk a bit about those anecdotes, and I think they're really, really interesting, and uh, it's a good read. The next book is a classic, uh, probably most of you know it already, um, <coughs> I just brought it up because really I think it's such a good read and a lot of the examples that are given in the book are actually 
real life examples, I can relate to them because it didn't, it wasn't as bad in my past experience as described in the book, but obviously some of the examples are really real life examples and uh, it's a well story, uh, a well written story, it's very interesting, so if you haven't read it, I can recommend it, it's really nice. Um, so when when uh, Sergio asked me to do a presentation on continuous delivery, um, I already had kind of ideas in mind what I'm going to talk about. And then one morning I stumbled upon this uh, uh, article here that uh, from uh, Eogan Nolan. And uh, he talks about the leadership interview questions that uh, Google, Facebook, and all these tech companies ask to understand whether uh, any, uh, the candidates that they interview, whether they are leadership material or not. And I went through the questions and thought that, okay, yeah, this is really interesting because um, by understanding the lean development principles, continuous delivery, I can actually answer those questions. And that is why I would like to actually go through the, these questions with you, talk about lean development, and at the end, uh, we can answer the interview questions, and hopefully you will get the next interview with Google or Facebook or whoever you want to apply to, and when you ask, ask these questions, you have the perfect answer for it. So the first question is, how do you deploy technology against the business strategy? Think about it. The answer is not waterfall. How do you address the dynamic nature of our priorities, which can be constantly changed or modified? Explain your decision-making process when it comes to major technology investment. And the last one is, how do you stay current in terms of knowledge and skills in the face of an ever-changing uh, technology landscape? So, these are the top four. He, he mentions the top five interview questions. Um, I'm not going to answer them now, but please keep them in mind for the last part of the session where we answer those questions then. So, why, why uh, lean development? I, I believe, I'm a strong believer, by following lean principles, you will come to a realization that this is the only way you will be able to deliver high quality software in time to your clients that satisfies the client's needs and uh, at the same time you will be able to innovate. So this is great stuff. Um, you ask yourself, what tool can I buy to actually make this happen for me. And I have to disappoint you, unfortunately, it's not about the tool. There is no tool that you can buy to make this happen. And um, the hard truth is, it's a cultural change that you need to go through if you are there, or you need to teach your colleagues to go through, and your organization, and everyone. So, it's not about the tool, it's a cultural change that needs to happen. And I'm going to talk about a bit of what this culture means, and, and you may have experienced kind of similar traits already in your organization. Maybe not. I have, certainly. So, I would like to talk about um, cars. Does anyone uh, know what this is, what this signifies? <coughs> Have you ever seen this? Do you know what this, uh, this thing here is? It's the Andon Court, it, it says here. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, lame joke, lame joke. Um, so, basically, uh, this is a, a Toyota car manufacturing, and uh, the Andon Court is actually quite an ingenious uh, device. What happens here is that whenever an employee here sees an issue with one of the cars that is being produced, um, he or she can pull the Andon cord and the whole uh, pipeline or the, the, the factory or 
the, the current uh, uh, car making process comes to a halt and actually the manager comes and identifies what the issue is together with the employee and they fix the, uh, the, uh, the issue and until it is fixed um, it, it, it stops, it doesn't continue and only when it's fixed uh, it continues. And that is, that is very important and, and for several reasons which I'm also going to allude to later onwards. But for now, um, as well is then once the issue is fixed, there is actually uh, the, the root cause is identified and it is made sure by continuously improving the process that this never ever happens again. And that is why uh, Toyota is, is able to produce great cars, high quality cars, because they understand that uh, every small issue is actually an opportunity for improvement and they have this concept of kata, um, uh, which is uh, 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 continuous improvement. And, now the, uh, and, and there are two reasons or multiple reasons why I'm telling you this. So the first reason is that if you see any issue with the, with the presentation, you can pull the cord and Sergio will come and save the day for us, hopefully. <laughs> And, and the second reason is that there are a lot of analogies in a delivery pipeline with a car manufacturing pipeline. And, and I will tell you later about why it is important that if there is an issue, that you stop and fix the issue before you continue. Because if you don't, you can imagine that actually you produce uh, bad quality builds that go into production. Um, oh. Good? Okay, now after talking about cars, uh, it's time to talk about birds. Uh, and it's not the movie, it's uh, the black swan theory. Who is familiar with the black swan theory? Sergio. So, the black, black swan theory was a, a, a theory described by Nassim Nicholas Taleb and uh, what he actually uh, describes or defines as a black swan event is a, as an improbable, rare event with an incredible high impact. And uh, they are so rare, these events, with a very low probability of occurring that um, they are very hard to predict. But obviously you want to be able to predict them because they have such a, a high positive or negative impact um, that uh, you could be the master of the universe if you were able to predict them. But unfortunately, nobody can predict them. And uh, his theory has a lot of um, followers in, in, in banking, finance, but also in, in, in science. Think about the discovery of uh, DNA is such a black swan event or uh, market crashes that nobody can really predict are black, uh, black swan events. And obviously you want to try to avoid them if they have a neg negative impact. And if they have a positive impact, you want to actually try to, uh, well, uh, uh, try to make it happen to you. And uh, it's all about um, statistics. Uh, produce software and deliver software. Um, and, and if you are trying to be innovative, you want to make it more probable to actually hit the checkpot. And the checkpot being uh, you have an application that users use, uh, and the more user the application used, uh, the better, right? And, and what, what, uh, what is depicted here is that you go through several iterations where you produce new features and uh, you have to go through a lot of iterations to uh, production that is so innovative and so great that everybody loves it and you see a spike in usage of the application. Now how do you, how do you uh, actually come up with such a feature? Uh, you don't know, right? You don't know. Otherwise if you would knew, 
if, if you would know, you would actually develop it in iteration one and don't care about anything else. But through many iterations of producing software, so the first iteration you have five users, second iteration three users because yeah, you introduced a bug, but then you go on, you go on, and the faster you are and the, uh, the more likely it is actually that you hit the jackpot. So it's a simple probability uh, measure that you can actually make it more likely to hit the jackpot by iterating faster. So meaning that if you apply lean principles and build high quality software, um, more often introduce it to, uh, to the client, you're actually able to uh, increase the likelihood of hitting the chatbot. So, um, and obviously what you can then think about is, okay, I can even uh, take a riskier approach and uh, the riskier approach is I do something with uh, feature toggles where I, I deliver unfinished products but still high quality features into production and uh, only enable them once the end-to-end -end feature is fully functional. And you can do that with uh, uh, feature toggles. Obviously, feature toggles is, uh, is not easy to implement, and uh, it requires a lot of uh, front-to-back alignment to make that happen. Uh, even better if you can actually do it based on trunk-based development, then you do true continuous integration, and we can talk about this a bit later, what exactly this means. And, and once you understand these principles, you will be able to uh, continuously deliver features into production that uh, are actually uh, not even completely uh, uh, the complete feature scope, but still fully, fun fu fully functional so that you can actually already expose them to the user, analyze the uptake, and understand whether the feature is actually successful or not. So it's all about delivering value to the, uh, to the customer, understand whether the customer likes the, the feature, and if not, what you do is, you are actually, uh, you further develop it, and uh, if you further develop it, you might actually see an increase in, in usage adoption. And if the feature is not um, liked by the customer, you take a decision either to improve it or you are, are actually abandoning it. There's nothing, work, nothing worse than uh, working on a feature that nobody likes, right? It's not only bad for uh, the company itself because they waste money. I'm, I'm motivated if I work on a feature that people like, right? It, it, it's good. So it's very important to actually uh, analyze the usage of any feature that you deploy into production. If not, you have no idea whether it's a waste of money. So optimize optimize the analysis of uh, features that are introduced so you can get an understanding of whether you are doing useful work or not. If you're not doing useful work, do useful work. And, and now I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how you can actually achieve that. And the only way you can really achieve um, uh, delivering features fast into production with too high quality is actually by applying um, a continuous delivery methods or, 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 or principles. And you have to set up uh, a, a delivery pipeline. And essentially, it's, it's relatively simple, right? It's, if you take the analogy from the car manufacturer, it goes through several stages and only once uh, the last stage, the release into production, has been uh, achieved or, or met, you release your uh, software automatically into production. Obviously, this is an ongoing product life cycle. We're talking about 
products, not uh, just software anymore. Um, very important is obviously that you honor the test pyramid here. What, do, what does that mean? Um, basically, you have a level of unit testing, you have a level of integration testing, you do performance testing, all these. Uh, you need to be sure that whatever is automatically done gives you very fast feedback. This is the most important uh, uh, fact here. Fail fast, because if you fail fast, you can fix it. If you fail in production, it takes a lot of uh, pain and a lot of overtime hours to fix it. You get yelled at, it's not good. So you want to you wanna fix it when it happens. And this is the very early stage. Actually, you can even uh, prevent that before you commit your code to your repository because you have unit tests locally running. And, and the test pyramid says nothing else than have a lot of unit tests that run very, very fast so you can actually uh, make sure that your build is, is, is good. Then you have a bit more uh, integration tests and uh, last but not least, you have a few end-to-end uh, -end integration tests. And, and hopefully, you don't have any manual tests, but there are still, uh, sometimes still manual testing is required. And we can debate about this along. I would like to hear your opinion on this. Um, what is very important is all this, of course, is automated, and no manual intervention should be necessary, but again, remember the, uh, the undone cord. At each stage, you want to be able to break or uh, uh, succeed and understand whether your build has the quality that is needed to go into production. So very important, visualize the progress, make it, uh, make it visible to the developers, to your managers even, or to change management that my build is currently here, it failed to deploy, so why am I even going to want to uh, release it into production? Yes, okay, it, it happens, right? Um, but you have the chance then to actually act at each stage and implement quality gates, right? You could coverage is not 70%, I'm stopping, until it is 70%. Okay, you can then, of course, arc, and we can have a debate at the end of the, of the talk whether yeah. KPI-driven development is the right thing. But the right thing to do is, all good? Um, the right thing to do is that you are confident that you're, do I need to do anything? Am I too late talking too much? Um, um, at, at any stage, you want to have confidence that the build artifact that you produce is actually of high quality. It's all about confidence, really. And you want to be confident that whatever you deploy into production is actually up to the standards that you want to have. Um, obviously, at each point in time, you can reject or retain release candidates treat every build as a potential release candidate because if everything passes and all the tests are good, you might actually want to deploy this into production. So be, be, don't, don't uh, create release candidates only at the end when everything is good. Treat every build as a potential release candidate. And once you have uh, mastered all these, you can then think about, okay, why not? Why do I not build my build environment every time I deploy? And then if you are fancy, why not build your environment where I deploy my code every time I can uh, uh, before I deploy? And, and you can spin this further and further, and there is no, no limit of how far you can go and how fast you can go. It's all about speed, fail fast, do write unit tests. I cannot, I cannot emphasize that enough. Unit tests are your friend. They are, not, they are your friend because five months down the line, you have to touch the same code 
if you don't have a unit test, you have no idea of whether it's good or not that you make the change. So it, it's, it's really the literature that is out there is out there for a reason, and, and we just have to do that. And I know for, from a past experience that uh, not everyone does it, and not everyone understands why you need to do it. It's not a pain. It's not a tick in the box that you do it. It's actually helping you to be faster and more relevant. So, so um, for this part, I would like to talk about um, some experiences of mine that I, that I had in my uh, previous companies and in, in past experience, um, where uh, a lot of a lot of uh, development one development was done on relational database management system. I know that uh, I don't know how many of you have to still work with relational databases, but uh, I do a lot, and. Uh, we don't have those fancy technologies because we do persist a lot of, of, of data that needs to be uh, securely, or I mean, that needs to be persistently and atomically stored. And, and therefore, we still rely on, on, on a lot of relational database management systems. But the, what a lot of times what I experience is that uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery with uh, relational database management system is not done because these systems are 20 years old, 40, 30 years old, and maybe not 30 years old, but 20 years old. And, and the people that were working with them, they, they were used to a certain process. And that process has been actually given, uh, passed on to other uh, developers over time and the process has not evolved much. Um, but still, you ask yourself then, okay, how can I do continuous integration and continuous delivery with relational database management system? And it is possible. So what do you have to do uh, in order to make that happen? Okay, first of all is, <coughs> you have to explain why you want to do this. Because um, the developer uh, doesn't believe that actually this is better or faster because the developer has done it for five years and maybe once or twice something has happened, but uh, most of the time it's all good and it, it's great how they do it. Manual deployments, we believe in manual deployments. Uh, the, second, the second, once you have, once you have mastered the first stage, why you do this, um, you have to actually check the scripts how they are source controlled. And, and you would, uh, it, it's actually sad, but uh, a lot of developers that I have had the pleasure to work with um, didn't really understand the, uh, the beauty of source controlling and revision controlling and, and uh, comparison of previous versions. So, uh, and with, with uh, database scripts, very often um, it was not properly done. You could also have used SharePoint to do uh, your source controlling for, for database scripts. So properly source control any scripts that is ever being deployed into a, uh, into a database. So treat it as an uh, infrastructure as code, if you will. Then once you have mastered this, you have to build tooling around uh, deployments, automation, and uh, actually, uh, well, uh, keeping track of, of your deployments into any database. And there are, you can build the tools yourself. I mean, it's not that difficult. Uh, all you need is a JDBC connection to a database and, and run the, the script. Um, there are good tools out there to do that, and we can uh, talk about tools that I've used in the past that are working very well. Um, I'm not mentioning any tools because remember it's not about the tool. Um, then what you have to make sure is that 
you make your deployments repeatable and item potent. So you can actually deploy the same script over and over again with the same uh, effect. This is very important because you want to keep track of the changes that you have made into your database. Ideally, you keep track in the database itself what you have deployed and not. Obviously, the last point, uh, the, the, the fifth, number five is you need to separate uh, environment properties from um, database environment properties from your source code uh, in order to make it uh, uh, deployable to any environment with the same process over and over again. So you use the same process, all you change is uh, your environment configuration to which database you deploy. Very important. Uh, the next point is somewhat uh, difficult and I haven't seen it done very often and I haven't seen it done greatly. So I think this is still a gray area in, in, in unit testing. You can write database unit tests. If you do it, you master it. Um, I think it's very important because ultimately what you want to want is that uh, I don't have to write unit tests because actually I have someone to write integration tests uh, once the Java code is deployed or your web service is deployed that calls the database objects, um, this, is, this is a bad excuse and will lead to many problems. You have to write database unit tests. But I understand this is not, not a trivial task because there aren't that many great frameworks out there that do that, but there are. Then, last but not least, you, you integrate with the CI tool of choice to make it runnable, repeatable. Deploy every database change uh, once you have a source code commit. Ideally, you deploy it first to a, a dev environment that is you and not directly to a, a, a user acceptance test environment or uh, SIT uh, system integration test environment. I've seen it all. Um, it, 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 it's important then to actually show a track of successful deployments in any environment with database calls. Right? You can then deploy automatically to dev. You have confidence that it works. You can deploy to the next stage. You have confidence that it works. But still a lot of people actually, or a lot of developer, directly deploy into uh, uh, UAT or uh, SIT. Um, or even worse, what they do is they send their script via email to the environment management team where they executed them from. So all of that needs to stop. You need to integrate it and, and automatically deploy it. Now, last but not least, once you have done all this, obviously somebody needs to write integration tests because you want to make sure that uh, your database code or objects work together with uh, your whatever web service or application code. And I know um, you might say that, okay, there are probably object relational uh, tools uh, out there that actually solve this problem for you, but you have to realize that not all of the uh, legacy applications, let me call it like that, or vendor applications are actually um, suited for this type of application. So there is still a lot of uh, database objects to be written and, and, and a lot of time, actually, uh, it's a hard debate between uh, database developers and, and Java developers who writes the more performant and, and faster uh, database access code. And you would be surprised that even in 2016, there are these kind of debates going on. And uh, last but not least, what you can then, once you have mastered this, uh, you can think about, okay, why not combine this with a data virtualization technology? Because what I can think then is, every time I uh, commit a change to my environment, or uh, to my source control repository, I refresh uh, uh, my database or my virtual database from a productive copy and apply my changes. So simulating, every time you do a code change, you simulate a production deployment. Therefore, you have very high confidence that uh, whatever you produce is actually 
working and, and working in production. And once you have done this, then there are still people out there who actually don't get it, and so you have to explain it again. It's continuous integration. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> and, and by the way, did I mention that it is not about the tool? It's really not about the tool, and uh, please believe me. Um, okay, so that is actually quite a, all of it that I wanted to uh, tell you. I could go on and on, and maybe we can actually talk in the question and answer sessions about this. But hopefully now we can actually go through the uh, interview questions before that and uh, get an understanding of actually why I think lean development is uh, the answer to a lot of these questions. So how do you deploy technology against a business strategy? By applying lean principles. How, how good can it be, right? It's lean, faster, better, higher quality, and uh, innovative at the same time. Second, how do you address the dynamic nature of your priorities which can be constantly changed or modified? It's not waterfall, it's you apply lean principles and you will be able to actually address this very uh, issue. Number three, explain your decision-making process when it comes to major technology uh, investments. Uh, the answer is not lean. The answer is you do a POC with the technology by applying lean principles, right? You don't want to spend uh, six months evaluating a product and then uh, after six months you realize, okay, yeah, this was not the right one. You want to be fast and nimble. And four, how do you stay current in terms of knowledge and skills in the face of an ever-changing technology landscape? By joining these meetup sessions and hopefully, hopefully I could actually uh, tell you a bit about uh, what I'm passionate about, what I think is uh, really important in nowadays ever changing digital world and hopefully uh, you take away some, some key points that I wanted to make and it was useful to you. So we have now time a bit for questions and answers and my question to you is when do you adopt continuous delivery and lean development if you haven't already? Who, is, who of you is doing lean development and delivery? Continuous delivery. Very yeah, good. Good. Who is doing waterfall? Huh? Search you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there, any, are, are there any questions? Was, it, was this useful to hear or are you already doing all of this? You knew all of this already? is really a big IT department, right? We have, it's really big and there are uh, a lot of teams that are actually working on legacy applications where uh, only maintenance is going on and there to introduce this kind of content is, is more difficult and more challenging. Um, but that doesn't mean that the concepts of continuous integration would not apply, right? Um, maybe from a continuous delivery perspective with our, and, and we have to say that, we have a lot of monolithic designs where um, let's say interdependencies between components exist and, and we are tra trying or part of my role in the bank is now to actually define strategies of how we can actually move 
transition away from a monolithic design to a more um, distributed designs uh, architecture so that we are actually freeing ourselves from these dependencies so that we can deploy components independently and apply these, the, these methodologies. But it is a, a long way to go because traditionally these systems have been built in a, in a way that um, it is more difficult to apply these principles, but it is still possible, right? So continuous integration, everybody can write test cases, everybody can integrate with a CI uh, tool, everybody can actually automate and uh, operationalize uh, their components. That is, not a, that is not an excuse, but it is more difficult. I, I, I would admit to that. But we are very determined to, to make that happen. Yes, how did you manage? So this is actually something that is still going on. I mean, it, it, it's, it requires quite a lot of uh, interaction and also not convincing, but the problem is the processes that have been established, they, are, they have been there since 20 years, right? And, and, and budgeting process, right? This is pure waterfall. You have to ask for money to deliver features that you don't know whether they are actually good or bad, um, you have to deliver that. And, and what, what we have uh, done is to approach this actually. We had many, many sessions with, uh, with the business um, to actually address these, these, these challenges. And we have not gone from 100, uh, we have not gone from zero to 100%, but we have managed to actually step by step uh, change the perception and the processes of how we want to deliver business value to them because they realize that as well, oh, I get things. I think Agile is a big, big driver to that. But the agile is not good enough, right? Because you do you deliver then waterfall agile, right? You just deliver in three months chunks, and uh, yes, you have a two-week sprint cycle. But it is still it is still better than actually um, uh, pure waterfall because every two weeks you can see a, a, a demo of your product and you see more or less what's going on. But now we are we have gone from a, a three-month release cycle. Uh, down to a monthly release cycle and hopefully we will be even even faster so but it is a long journey and uh, it is difficult and I have a question. Yeah. Uh, with vendors how do you change uh, vendors waterfall contracts because recurrent contracts with vendors are very waterfall give you a budget you give me this delivery did you already change contracts uh, not yet no this is a big discussion that we need to have with our vendors because they have to uh, adopt as well exactly. and if they don't uh, but on the other hand what my my view on that is that you have to try to isolate yourself from those changes um, and not fall into the trap that I will only deploy my changes if the vendor is ready you deploy your changes as soon as you are ready and uh, once the vendor comes in you are actually uh, already ready and you focus on other things. But this is still a, this is still a, a, a problem, yes. Yes. I think there is a the process of continuous delivery and continuous integration. So for you cite a lot of tests there. So who write, write those tests? The developers. And those, then they put the code in a uh, version control. So who gets the code, goes to create the pipeline, checks if the tests are good enough or not good enough, how, how this process works? So at the moment is um, we come. Uh, it's it's an organization that has has grown organically, and it was very waterfallish 
steadily grown, right? We have, we have, uh, uh, or we had development teams, and we have QA teams, and we have um, environment management teams, and all of these, the, the, these teams that have to actually produce software together that that works, which is non-working. But we are, we started off, let's say, as, as very traditional. And what happens over time is that uh, the boundaries between the teams are actually moving away. So we don't have uh, QA engineers that do only QA. We don't have developers that only do development. And I think this is then the very first step of um, teams realizing that they are working on a product rather than on, I only do development. So they, they go through the whole product life cycle and, and by by changing that realization, care of oh, I can write a, an integration test there. Um, why why don't uh, why don't we pair and do it together? And uh, I think we are not there yet where we want to be, right? Uh, but I think we are on the on the right step that uh, the teams are actually or the teams are self-organized and they can actually tackle uh, a feature front to back rather than we have the team that only looks at this component and this team looks only at this component. We have front to back teams that are empowered and able to actually deliver everything. Integration tests, end-to-end -end integration tests, and so forth. I think th this is very important that um, you go away from thinking of um, uh, kind of uh, uh, teams that only or, or developers that only do one thing, a developer should be able to do everything. And uh, uh, so we try to apply a, 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 the Spotify model where we have uh, squads that do certain um, things front to back rather than only one thing. And, and because then you are actually again go, going into the uh, dependency you don't resolve the dependency issue. I'm always, I'm always saying this, and, and this is maybe very corny, but I think it's much harder to resolve the dependency issue than actually uh, going or isolating yourself from that, that dependency issue. So uh, the microservice approach is, is very much um, helping in that, that respect so that you don't create dependencies, you actually isolate yourself from dependencies. Actually, I will not stop. I mean, I think we can move the conversation to the break area and we'll yes. have like this. We just, I'll need to prepare for the next uh, presentation. So. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Please.